Right. Hi, um, my name is Surya Matu. I'm uh, excited to talk to you all today. I'm going to warn you straight up that I'm probably one of the less hardware related people in this space, so I'm sorry about that, but um, I will hopefully tell you some stories that are relevant to the kind of work you do also. Uh, so a bit of background, my, I'm an artist and uh, data journalist and engineer. Um, I'm currently a resident at iBeam. Uh, I'm at a place called The Markup, which most of you probably not heard of because we only came into existence on Monday. Uh, hopefully you will eventually hear of us, but we will see. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, and I'm also a research fellow at the Center for Civic Media at MIT. So the majority of the stuff I do is actually um, what I think of as like data-driven investigations. But before I kind of dive into the stuff I've learned doing that kind of work, I want to first give you, prove my hardware creds by telling you that I once did this, which is that I went on a boat outside Mar-a-Lago and Wi-Fi scanned it to see how vulnerable the Wi-Fi they have over there is. And it turns out it's very vulnerable. Um, as you expect, I also, that's the Trump International Golf Club, uh, also down in Florida. We did this in a bunch of places, it's all terrible, but turns out in 2017, the worst thing about the presidency is not the Wi-Fi. So what are you gonna do? Um, <laughs> uh, another hardware thing I did is, uh, I did this story a couple of months ago with my ex-colleague at Gizmodo, Kashmir Hill, where we basically built a router that collected all the network traffic going through a home, and she had like, I think, 16 different IoT devices connected to a place, and we just kind of looked at all the data that was going through it. And our kind of objective when we did this story was, wasn't so much to kind of see all the like, kind of security vulnerabilities, it was more to think about like, as a, as a kind of regular user, what are the ambient emissions of your home? when you're living with all these smart devices, right? So how often are your homes like pinging back to the servers and the companies and saying, hey, give me information, and how often are like those companies pinging your devices and saying, hey, we wanna talk to you? Uh, again, turns out there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, the Alexa, I think, uh, talks to its servers every three minutes, which was kind of terrifying. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna get into that stuff. The code for all this was open source. Yes, we believe in that in the journalism world also, and uh, we've, we've had some interesting kind of findings through that. But what I really want to kind of make this talk about is this question that kind of drives all the work we do, which is how do you fight injustice if you can't see it, right? So when we're talking about technical systems, especially in 2018, one of the biggest challenges we have is it's very hard to prove the bad stuff that's happening, even though it's very easy to hypothesize it. So it's very easy for people to say like, oh, if you have this kind of algorithmic system, these are all the terrible things that could happen, but when you don't have evidence, you kind of get stuck in this trap, right? And what ends up happening is stuff like this, where like in 2016, Mark Zuckerberg can come around saying, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna do a little bit of Facebook bashing. I know we're all over it, but I'm gonna try to take it in a new direction that you maybe you've not heard of. Um, so yeah, so 20, 2016, Facebook can come out and say that uh, we had no idea that uh, there's no way our algorithms could possibly be used to sway voters, right? This is not possible. And then exactly one year later, he comes out um, apologizing for the kind of stuff that's already happened. Right? And this isn't, a, this is this one example of a pattern that's constantly repeated in the tech industry. And I think the kind of the root cause of that is it's very hard to, uh, in our kind of mindset around justice, it's very hard to decouple intent from accountability, right? So if you aren't intending to do something bad, how could you be accountable for the bad stuff that's happened? But my argument back to that is that the only reason we don't find the bad stuff is because we're not explicitly looking for it. And a lot of the work we do as data journalists is we're not, so like I think of this as like what I've been thinking of as like adversarial research, and like I bet a lot of people in this room, what it's really about is just like reverse engineering a system to understand its vulnerabilities and where it breaks, right? But the only difference is that in this sort of framing, especially in the data journalism world, along with the hardware and software, we also want to think about the people who are, who are making those decisions, right? So the kind of the prompt for us often is, um, how do I say this? Yeah, so it's basically focusing on understanding how the, not how the algorithms work, but explicitly focusing on who they harm. So I don't really care about like how a particular system works. It could have a lot of complexity and ML and data and blah, blah, blah behind it. But how does it actually play out in the real world? Because when these systems come out of 
out of their kind of eco, their like you know uh, incubated ecosystems, the values that are of that space are kind of imbued within these within these technologies, right? So what I mean by that is that like when people when companies come out and say, hey, we built a product, we had no idea it could be used in that way. It's because somewhere they didn't actually explicitly state how it should be used and what values they wanted it to have. And if this sounds very abstract, I'm now going to dive into an example of what I mean by this. And the example I'll dive into is an investigation I did over the last year with Kashmir Hill at Gizmodo around the on Facebook's People You May Know algorithm. So does everyone here know the People You May Know algorithm? Is it all old enough to use Facebook? Right? No one's so young that Facebook is like something dads use. Um, or if you are, that's cool too. But People You Know, for those who don't know, is the algorithm that basically uh, Facebook uses to suggest friends to people, right? And when you look at the interface, it's like it's super banal. It's just like in the top right corner. You don't really think much about it. But when you start kind of start thinking about it, this algorithm is one of the most like kind of uh, the biggest drivers of how Facebook builds its business, which is actually just building its social graph. Right. So the way the way the way in which they connect us to each other is that's their main asset is that they have a social graph of like two billion people. And this is one of the ways in which they can actually really build that. And we've seen some like kind of terrible stuff happen around us already. So Cash showed a story. A story in 2016 where she talks about how um, psychologists and psychiatrists would be suggested that patients on people on, uh, on Facebook, even though they had taken a lot of care to not like have any separation, and it's because we don't really know all the ways in which this is happening, right? But so we started with that, and uh, she already written the story, and we were really curious in trying to understand how to um, how far this goes, like how this actually works. So what we ended up doing was I built her a scraper, and for like three months. We just like ran the scraper on our own accounts and just like scrolled through this page where they suggest to friends and like made a, a note of it in a CSV file and just collected it, collected it, and collected it. We did it for like three months. It was really what we were hoping we'd be able to do, which we kind of knew we wouldn't, is we wanted to be able to say, hey, this person got suggested to me because I did this thing, or this person got suggested to me because of this hypothesis I may have. Obviously, it's really hard to do that because there's like 100 parameters that go into each of these decisions, and there's no way to know what the weights are for each one of those recommendations. What we did find, though, so after three months of scraping and like lots of people collected, we didn't really find anything interesting, but we did find one interesting person, and that was a woman named Rebecca Porto. And that led to this story. So I have to read this because it always confuses me. But Rebecca Porto is Kashmir's great aunt by marriage. She is married to Kashmir's biological grandfather's brother. A biological grandfather is a man who she has never met with the last name Porto, who abandoned her, her father when he was a baby. Her father was adopted by a man whose last name was Hill. He didn't find out about this, his biological father, until adulthood. So this woman that Kashmir was suggested to on Facebook is related to a man <laughs> who has a biological connection to her father who her father has never met and she didn't even know existed. And so it's kind of messed up that Facebook can do that. <laughs> Right? And again, the beauty of the way these systems work is that they don't even know how they did that. Or they, so, so they claim that they don't know how. There's no way for them to know how they did that. Right? And then we wrote this story, and we got a flood of, of emails from people talking about their experiences with, uh, with people you know. And I didn't even think about this because I'm not a part of this community, but it turns out this algorithm is super harmful to members of the LGBTQ community and sex workers because they work really hard to keep different parts of their lives siloed. And if they use the same smart device, then it's all gone, right? And there's no way for them to, to do anything about it. There's no, there's no like switch you can flick. There's nothing kind of implicitly in your, uh, explicitly stated in your app that lets you kind of silo those things. And this is where like the kind of tension comes with the business model, right? Because Facebook is just thinking about the fact that, hey, we've got to build our social graph. Is it great when everyone's connected to each other? What they're not considering is, no, not all the time, no. <laughs> Think about going to a dinner party and how many people you don't want to talk to, right? Imagine doing that at the scale of like, humanity. It's terrifying. <laughs> obviously, this is going to happen. But they're obviously not thinking about that. So anyway, so we wrote this story. And at the end of this story, we talk about how, um, how you can opt out of this. So we, had, we, we, we emailed Facebook, we told them about the sum, and said, oh yeah, all you have to do is you have to kind of go to your settings and put this thing, make, go to this drop-down menu and select no one, and then no one will be able to discover you through your profile. We wrote that in the story, and literally like within minutes of the story coming out, uh, people wrote back to us and said, hey, that setting doesn't exist on my page. 
So basically, this is what that setting looks like for most people. There is no no one option. It just says, who can see your friend requests? Everyone, friends of friends. Right? So like this right here, and this isn't something that Facebook has been told about since like 2012. And people have written about harassers harassing them. Like there's so many examples of FTC complaints that of course it's all we can do, we can complain to the FTC, have said that, hey, your drop down menu is oppressive. Right? And they don't they kind of don't give a shit. And what happened when we wrote this story was they said, oh right, turns out we were wrong, we didn't really think about this. You got to write this awesome headline where people at Facebook don't know how Facebook works because that's basically what they they told us. The PR person was like, oh yeah, it turns out that setting is now only available to people who we deem to be public figures and it's not available to anyone else. Right? So we're like, cool, can you just like turn it on because we're literally telling you about how this is harming people. I said, yeah, 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 totally. We totally hear you. We've made political data free. You can access it. We really believe in the harms of society. We got you. And then obviously like nothing, nothing happens. But then you start like digging into this even further, right? And start like understanding how these systems are operating and what the things are at play. The thing you still learned about, about how these connections often happen is something called shadow profiling. How many people here know what shadow profiling is? Awesome. So shadow profiling is when basically person A, person B, person C. Person A and person C are on Facebook. Person B is not on Facebook. Person A and person C have person B's phone number in their contact address. Facebook now knows about person B and because through their contact number and knows that they are connected to person A and C. So whether you have consented to it or not, if you have ever shared your phone number with someone who uses Facebook, Facebook knows about you. No matter how much you have tried to not let Facebook know about you. Right? And this is just like a thing. It's not like a super scary thing or whatever. I don't mean to make it like super terrifying. It's just like this is just how the system works. And the reason it works like this isn't so much to do with the fact that they explicitly want to collect everything. It's like they haven't really thought about their business model outside the context of making money for their, from, for, like, on a quarterly basis, right? And I think that's kind of the point of a lot of this, the thinking around this stuff. It isn't to, and especially with like, this like open source hardware, which I think is so cool, is that the values are like an explicit part of the society, of the, thing, of the community you're building, right? We're all here in this room because you believe in something about this technology that's beyond just commodifying it out, like getting the product out. And I think like, that's something that we need to see happen at a bigger scale, but like it's awesome that it happens in places like this. So yeah, so anyway, so we wrote this story, we found out all this terrible stuff, Facebook said we're totally gonna change it, they still haven't changed it. And then we just did a deep dive into um, all the patents they have, which, which mentions uh, friend requests, and it's like terrifying. They actually have a patent that says, we, are going to, we can figure out if two pictures have been taken by the same camera without any metadata, just by looking at like, the dust pattern and scratches on your lens, right? And these are like microscopic size things. So anyway, so this is all happening. What we ended up doing though, was as a part of our investigation, like, all right, we want to, like, we, so we weren't interested with the people you may know stuff so much to understand how the algorithmic system works. We just wanted to hear the anecdotes of which kind of people does it harm. And so what we did was we built a tool uh, that let there was open source is like a web like an electron app that you could download and collect basically your own Facebook friends recommendations every every like six hours. So all this thing would do is it would go to Facebook for you and like go to that page with friends request and just scroll all the way to the bottom, just scroll all the way and like make a note of it in a CSV file and save it for you locally. We got this uh, we got the app security audited, we got the app um, it was all open source, so you could see that the data wasn't being sent anywhere. It was all locked down to be data that you're collecting for yourself because this is, there is no API for this. This is not something you can collect from Facebook's API. You cannot actually collect your own data, right? And obviously, so we wrote it that what it looks like it's super ugly, but that's because I was the only person working on it. It was more of a political statement anyway, guys, so don't... <laughs> Yeah, I don't shit on my color skills, color schemas, but, um, but we wrote that and then literally like uh, the next day, uh, the next day we got an email from Facebook saying, hey, you can't do this, it's in violation of our terms of service, right? And we're like, why? 
were letting users collect their own data and they said, well, you're making them log into Facebook from a non-Facebook thing, that's not cool, you're letting them automate their own data collection, that's not cool, so you're violating your terms of service. And we were like, listen, we understand how those things are violations from the perspective of like competition or someone using this for business practice, but we made this code, or code open source, we made this something that you can just like download and we've got it security audited, right? Like there's more than most products on the market. And, you, and, you, and like we do, we, our intention is not for people to send us data, we literally put it in the bottom, they're like, send, see, you find someone, no, they send us a tip. We were in, this was like a tip generator, it wasn't meant to be a data collector. But there are there. So this is what they response to us, which is they said, I discussed the general concept of the people you may know inspector with the team, and with respect to whether it is possible to build the inspector in a policy compliant manner, and our engineers confirmed that perhaps the, that our platform does not support this. Like that's cookie language, right? If you understand how technology works, it's like, what do you mean you don't support it? It's on my page, it's my data, so I'm gonna take it. <laughs> Right? This is what I mean about like, including human beings in the algorithmic systems we investigate, because surprise, surprise, humans drive all of this. Right? The technology doesn't actually, yeah, it's a good one. I, know. I was very proud of myself when I found that. Uh, it took me a long time to cut that out at the right loop size, but I did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, but the point being that like the humans drive are always involved in some of this. And this stuff doesn't just happen in a vacuum, it happens because we're not explicit about the values we're putting into our technology. So I'm really excited to be here talking to you guys because I know everyone here kind of believes that already. And I just wanted to give you like a eh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>